Uh, welcome all of you to the Valen series speaker four session. And uh, we, are, we have Dr. Amir Adam Mohammed from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Dr. Amir Adam Mohammed is a consultant orthopedic surgeon, Prince Court Medical Center in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He received his undergraduate degree from University of Malaya and continued his orthopedic training in National University of Malaysia. He is subspecialty trained and possesses fellowship certificates in hand and microsurgery from Singapore and orthopedic trauma from Japan. He's actively involved in wide awake surgery. He was selected as one of the editors for Valence Surgery. He has participated and organized several domestic and international scientific meetings and workshops pertaining to hand and wide awake surgery. He's also authored multiple international and local publications in reputed journals. He also serves as a peer reviewer for several local and international journals pertaining to orthopedic and, and volume surgery. Over to you, Amir. Thank you, Hitesh. So I'll jump straight to it. Um, how far can we go with Valant? So I'll describe a bit more on upper and lower limb procedures that we can do under Valant. So as um, uh, Kostas um, mentioned before, we can do distal radius fracture under Valant. So this is your typical distal radius fracture where um, the technique for injection is actually two parts of it. First is the tumorous anesthesia where the we injected 10 mils, 10 to 15 mils of local anesthesia at the first where we going to do the incision part. And the second, third and fourth injection is where we inject the periosteal injection, where I injected first at the radial side of it. Then we go slowly walk the bone to the volar side and the dorsal side of the radius. So this is a video, you can see it together. First of all, we give the 10 to 15 mils of subcut injection where we are going to the inject the surgical incision. And here is the periosteal injection. And this video is actually sped up eight times, so it's quite fast. And here we inject about 10 to 15 mils again at the dorsal aspect of the distal radius, so we can cover there. And if the patient have concurrent ulnar stylet fracture, we injected about 10 mils there. So this will cover the parasols part where the fracture is. So this um, picture shows where the periosteal and also the subcutaneous injection is. The blue color is where our tumor and anesthesia will be. And the pink color is where our periosteal injection will cover the whole fracture site and where we want to put the plate in. So the advantage of Wallen in this case is you can see without using a tourniquet, the adrenaline, the epinephrine is good enough to give us a clear surgical field where we can do the surgery without any um, blood uh, covering our uh, surgical area. Here it can show that we can do intraoperative active motion you can, to see that the fixation is quite stable and there is clear um, surgical feel and the patient is quite happy with the surgery without any pain. And the advantage of doing this under well, and the next one is actually during closure, whereby if we do we use a tunique before we do the skin closure, what we normally do is we off the tunique and um, secure the hemostasis with bipolar um diatomy but in this case since there is not much bleeding there there will be no um what uh, swelling um, after the surgery if you want to read further you can read um our paper that we published in 2018 in journal of hand surgery um America, this is the first paper that shows how the, uh, the technique on how to do a Wallan for distal radius fracture. Since then, there's a few papers from uh, Taiwan, um, from other countries that have been done um, doing plating distal radius under Wallan. Next, we go uh, more proximal. Um, we can do also Montagia fracture under Wallan. And this is how I give the injection. Same thing, we give where the incision site is. We give about 10 to 10, 15 mils there. 
and we give proximal to distal for the ferrocell injection. Same thing, we put at the lateral side, then we go volar and also dorsal for all the ferrocell part of the bone. So this will cover the fracture side. Since in Montagia fracture, there's dislocation of the radial head. So we give inside the elbow joint at that area to reduce the pain while, while we're reducing the dislocation. So this is the coverage again. The pink, the blue area is actually the um, tumor cell anesthesia where the skin initiation is, and also the pink is actually the periosteal and also the uh, injection to the joint. Here you can see the clear surgical field without any much bleeding. Patient is moving the elbow joint, showing that the radial head dislocation has already been reduced. And obviously, patient is not in pain. Further proximal, we can do all the fracture under um, Wallant. So the similar injection technique, we start from proximal to distal. I use 27 gauge needle here to give the tumor cell anesthesia. So I use 1% um, lidocaine plus um, 1 in 100,000 adrenaline for such cases. Then we go parosium, proximal to distal. Similar, go pro posterior two mils and four mils for each side of radial and ulnar side of the bone. So roughly total anesthesia for this kind of cases, you can go from 40 mils to about 60 to 70 mils, depending on the size of the patient. Lastly, I give about 10 mils of intraarticular injection to the elbow joint, just to numb the joint area. So this is a um, cross section of the elbow joint. So like I said before, we give two mils directly on the posterior aspect of the olecranon and go slowly to the radial and ulnar side of the bone. So this will in, in turn cover the whole olecranon where the fracture site is. Again, the distribution is uh, blue color is actually subcutaneous region and also pink is the bony area. Similar here. You see the coverage of the bone, you can cover the whole olecranon until the anterior aspect of it by using this type of injection. So this is a tension band wiring of the olecranon. The beauty of this is you can ask the patient to immediately do active motion and the patient is quite stable with that. What about a commutated olecranon fracture in this case? Um, obviously, we can't do tension band wiring for this kind of cases, but we did, we did plating for this. So similar te injection technique, and the patient is moving, and you can see that there's stable reduction there. So we published this case uh, in Journal of Hand in 2019, and we can read it further there. So. Besides that, at the elbow joint, we have radial hip fracture. You can see a quite common fracture there. So injection technique again. So ideally, we, um, we inject for using a 27 gauge needle, go from proximal to distal. But in this case, I, I injected from distally. But anyway, um, again, subcutaneous, then we go deep to periosteum. Give near to the fracture site and also in the elbow joint. And coverage as, as you've seen here. Blue is the subcutaneous region and the pink is actually the periosteal region. So this patient is um, showing him um, lifting the limb on their own during draping. And here you can see the surgical field is very, very good compared to in a GA, even though using a 10 sometimes it is not working that great. And you can see there's a much bleeding here. 
So this is the results after the surgery. And active motion, you can see during pronation and supination, where the radial head is interarticulating with the humerus without any impingement, and you don't see any uh, PIN injury. So when you go back home, you can uh, be sure that you didn't injure the PIN during the surgery. Another patient showing the similar um, post reduction and clear surgical field without any bleeding there. Right. So everything is very, very good. So we go further proximal in the upper limb. What about mid shaft clavicle fracture? Again, the injection technique we give subcutaneous using a 27 gauge needle where we do the surgery, the incision part. Then we go deep, two, four, four, two on top of the clavicle and anterior and posterior to the clavicle. Total of about 40 to 60 mils of lidocaine is good enough for this kind of cases, depending on the severity of the injury. So again, this is the blue and uh, pink where the parasol is and blue is the subcutaneous region. So before I do my surgeries, I always check the um, Wallace effect where I palpate and manipulate the fracture site and ask the patient whether the patient has any pain or not. Okay, the most important thing is that you have to tell the patient that they will always feel the pressure, but make sure that they don't feel the sharp pain, right? the fracture kind of pain. But tell them that you, they will always feel the pressure um, over the um, bony areas. So again, patients lifting their own limb during the draping. And this is after the reduction and plating, where we can see the stability of our fixation while patient moving the shoulder joint. So this is a, your typical lateral clavicle fracture where I normally use a clavicle hook plate. The disadvantage of using this is we have to remove the plate with after um, about six months or to one year. And this is the patient while drilling. Okay, she's comfortable while doing the reduction and also doing the surgery. So there it is. After the drilling, you make sure that the patient is comfortable, moving without any problem with the fixation. Okay, uh, if let's say patient is um, not comfortable, we can give the patient to watch a Netflix while doing your surgery. And we published this recently and it was accepted two weeks ago in Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery. You can read further there in the, um, the, the, the journal. So what about lower limb now? We go from ankle fracture. All right, so where we do the surgery, again, we put 10 mils at the subcutaneous region of lateral malleolus. We go proximal to distal for the parostium. Similar technique, two, four, four. Anterior four and posterior four. Just to make sure that you cover the whole lateral malleolus. So for the medium malleolus, similar. We give about 10 mils at the subcutaneous region and about 10 mils at the, at the medium malleolus, at the parasteal region. So always check after you're giving the injection whether the patient is still, still having pain or not after the, surge, after the injection. Right, so this is the coverage again. Blue is the subcutaneous region where the incision site is. 
and pink is a parasitogen. This is post fixation. And patient is not in pain and moving the ankle as per normal. So when we ask the patient here, the V is cost about one. Okay, we go further proximal um, mid shaft to the fibular fracture, post fixation, similar injection technique. We give proximal to distal, subcutaneous about 10 mils there, where the incision site is. And this is a periosteal injection. So for this, um, ideally you want to give a bit more because tibia is quite a big bone. So if you need more volume, like what Don and Costa said before, you dilute a bit, a bit further, all right? So you can get a bit more of volume. So even though we didn't fix the fibula, we just give the Wallan solution there to numb the area for our reduction for the tibia plating. So again, this is how I check. Originally it was five, sorry, four. So now, is it zero? Zero, eh? So no pain at all, eh? So I can move your leg. So no pain at all. Pain score zero. is zero. Zero pain. So you can see the deformity. I wish I had no pain, eh? All right, go. So this is, again, the distribution of our Wallan solution. Uh, blue is the incision site subcutaneous injection and pink is a parasol injection. Similar here. I, I sometimes, most of the time I will use about 100 mils for this kind of cases because it's quite a big areas to, to cover. Sorry, this, okay, so this is during the, many, the reduction and after the plating. Just to show you that the patient is not in pain and also can move the ankle joint without anything. So further proximal patella fracture is quite an easy one to do as it is very superficial. So again, subcutaneous, the incision site about 10 mils there. Then we go deep to cover the superior pole of the patella. So what I do is I go straight down to the bone, then I walk the bone to both sides, medial and lateral, to cover the proximal part of the patella. And now the next one is actually at the fracture site to cover the proximal and distal fragment. 10 mils there. And lastly, the inferior pole of the patella. So total about 40 to 50 mils is more than enough to cover the whole patella for tension band wiring. Again, this is the uh, distribution of the Wallan solution. And you can check immediate active motion after reduction of the patella, where the extensor mechanism is intact with the tension band wiring in place. So again, another patient that we did uh, tension band wiring of the patella. Okay. So thank you. That's all for my presentation.
younger, you've got, you've gone into a lot of extent uh, for using uh, local anesthesia. Uh, I mean, wall and surgery for a wide variety of conditions. Uh, I think we'll have a question answer session right now. So let's start with the uh, Amir itself first. So, Prof. Donald, questions to Amir? Uh, Amir, I, I have a question for you. So I know that uh, you and uh, Dr. Chen in Taiwan have a bit of a different approach. He likes to inject the uh, hematoma, uh, fracture hematoma first. Can you hear Prof. Donald? Proximal to distal. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you go proximal first and do your hematoma block kind of in the middle and then distally. I, I kind of like the idea of proximal to distal, but what do you think of his idea of starting with a hematoma block injection first? Um, the reason I do proximal to distal is like what you said before, where if you start injecting the proximal part, the distal part will be much, much less pain for the patient. Plus, if you inject straight at the hematoma, it might displace the fracture if it's a small fracture like a distal radius fracture, which doesn't really make a difference, but the most important part is actually to give less pain to the patient after the proximal injection. Thank you so much. Can you stop sharing your screen so that we can see a full screen, please? Oh, sorry. Full screen. How do I do that? <laughs> stop sharing. Stop sharing. Um, this is closed PowerPoint. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anybody I've, else? Uh, have a yeah, yeah, Don. Actually, I'll I'll add to Amir's response, if I may. The so I've encouraged my team down in ED to inject uh, distal radiuses instead of a hematoma block is to do a field block with Wallant. Um, and they are absolutely loving it. So they use 30 or 40 mils, 20 on the back, so 10 on the radial side, 20 across the back, 10 to 15 across the front, sub as a sort of ring block of the wrist. Um, and I'm planning on putting wires in like that, and they, it's so easy. So actually, I'm not a great fan of hematoma blocks because where's it gonna go? I, I don't understand injecting into a hematoma doesn't make sense to me. The way I look at it is if you do the hematoma block, and in the old days when I used to do hematoma blocks, you're moving the fracture around before mm. the local has a time to knock out the nerves. If you, inject, if you inject proximally, you knock out the nerves before, <laughs> Many before you inject into the hematoma. So it seems to me, I mean, I've never had a broken bone, and I, so I don't really know the answer, but it seems to me that it makes more sense. Ali, I got a question for you. Sure. So, because I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm a bit of an orthopedic dummy in that way. But when when you have a distal radius fracture, sorry, you, sorry, don't answer that for a sec. Oh, if if you have a distal radius fracture, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. If you have a distal radius fracture and you're going to be doing K wires and not opening it. Are you worried about tumescent local anesthesia causing a compartment syndrome? Because if you're opening it, then you're definitely not going to get a compartment syndrome. All the liquid comes out. But if you put in 50 cc's into a closed compartment, even though it's fractured, uh, are you worried about compartment syndrome? I've, I've put, I've, I use 50 to 60 mils at the end of cases uh, routinely. So what I tend to do is I say to my anaesthetist, just knock them out, put, do a GA, because most of my patients, I have an anaesthetist available, they do a regional or a general. A lot of the time in trauma, we're just trying to get through because we have 20 cases lined up. So they knock them out quickly. And at the end of the case, or if I've got an anaesthetist who can't block, then uh, I say, how much 0.5% bupivacaine can they have? And they say 20 or 30, female, male. And then I, in, I bulk that up just like you do with 40, 50 mils of saline. So for hip fractures, they quite often have a GA and then I'll put in 30 mils of bupivacaine, 0.5% with 150 mils of 
uh, saline. And you just do a capsule infiltration. So for a wrist, I'll use for a, say I was fixing your wrist, uh, it would be 30 mils of 0.5% plus 30 mils of saline. Um, because the, the vials of 0.5 and 0.25 are the same and they cost the same, but you've got half as much in one. So you just half the price by using the 0.5 and diluting it. So, you know, for me, that's a no brainer. Uh, no, I've never seen any problems with compartment syndrome. What about all. you, Costas? Are you worried about compartment syndromes? Nope, at all. not at all. I mean, I have used massive uh, doses of local anesthetic in patients. They have never seemed to develop uh, compartment-like sim symptom syndrome, syndrome symptoms before they go to theater in that short period of time. And plus, as Ali said, when we add a lot of local anesthetic in the end of the cases, we blow up the heart again. Uh, I think uh, this risk is not substantial. I cannot believe that 50 ml of local anesthesia in a closed wound can cause some bar compartment syndrome. I don't know if anyone else thinks differently. I, I think it has never been reported as well. And many cases where orthopedic surgeons have used hematoma blocks, they have used massive lo loads of the massive amounts of local anesthetic. So I don't think it's an issue. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah, uh, to add to that, I've used about 50 to 60 mils in an old lady for um, close manual reduction for a colis fracture, no issues at all. Yeah, Amir, I got a question for you. <laughs> do you think it's actually possible to do a total knee? With <laughs> um, okay, that's a big question. <laughs> it is possible, theoretically, it is because the Important part is you have to co cover the incision site and also the um, the parasail region. So if you can cover it with enough volume, um, enough duration of time, it theoretically is, is definitely possible. The, there will be an issue with, with your alignment because if you're using navigation or uh, um, a, a robot, that's fine. But mm -hmm. with traditional techniques, you'd use an intermodellary rod which mm -hmm. you'd have to um, numb them up to their groin. Which <laughs> might use a, quite a lot of local. <laughs> yeah, that will be our limitation, definitely. I, I see absolutely no reason why, why you couldn't do big volume local anesthesia for wrist replacements. I've done PRC, I did the scapholunate ligament reconstruction. You know, I, the, 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 the key thing with that one was actually did, did a, a mid forearm regional block and then mm -hmm. use the local as well. Mm -hmm. You can mix up your techniques. Um, as long as you've got the intraoperative movement, I think that, that helps. That, 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 that's key. No tourniquet. Right. No tourniquet, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ali, I have a question for you. It's, it's about bupivacaine because you use it more routinely than I do. Uh, have you ever had patients who come back to the emergency department after your bupivacaine blocks and complain about the fact that they're numb, but that's hurting because the pain part of bupivacaine relief only lasts half the time of the numbness part. So the touch and pressure stays numb for more than 30 hours with digital blocks with level two evidence in humans, whereas the pain part comes back at half that time. So do they come back to your emergency room complaining to your emergency room docs about, geez, my hand hurts, but it's numb? Never seen it. Um, uh, I've talked to a lot of patients about it. So, so when I had my local, I just had 1% and I had a tourniquet on because it was revision surgery uh, and Carlos just wanted to uh, get the dissection right before he let the tourniquet down and do the active movements. And I tell you what, having the, the tourniquet letdown pain was unbelievably awful. Um, I had an ankle arthroscopy where they put local anesthetic in and the pain when the local wore off was unbelievably awful. Um, but I've never seen it or, or had anybody say that it's really, the pain comes back with a vengeance. Um, just We're haven't seen it with a vengeance just they, they think something's wrong because yeah. they feel but it hurts yeah i haven't seen it um i totally appreciate it and i think it must 
feel very weird. Um, it does. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but but I, I do like giving people 15, 18 hours of pain relief. I think they get a good night's sleep and that's often a good thing. Yeah, what, what I worry about that is that, you know, people are walking around like this yeah. for seven hours because it doesn't hurt. And so they're going to get hematomas and they have no respect for the fact that they mm. just had an operation. So I'm not a big game fan. Um, I, that, also, it's cardiotoxic if you get a good intravenous blast. Unlike lidocaine, yeah. you can get an intravenous blast and that's totally safe. But you can't do that with bupivacaine. I just want to warn people about that. Mm. I have personally stopped using bupivacaine for the last uh, year or so. I'm happy with my lidocaine, even for big cases. Like the case that I did yesterday, which took, went on for three hours, I had no issues at all and the patient was comfortable. So no reason for me to use anything else. Yeah. Same here, even when I do my tibia, my ankle, I don't uh, do need to use bupivacaine because I think it's quite an enough to use the lidocaine and adrenaline. Um, where it can last up until about eight hours is quite more, more than enough for my surgery. Yeah. I, I'd like to address the issue of seizures, if I could, uh, because we have all seen people who come in, you take their cast off or their bandage off after a cut, and they faint. And when they faint, it can look like a seizure, like people go stiff and their eyes roll back and they get tonic and clonic movement. That's what fainting looks like when they fall down. And so part of the problem here is sometimes people faint even when they're lying down because of the sight of the needle, even when you haven't done anything yet. And it looks like a seizure. And I wondered if, you know, maybe the patient that you're talking about uh, Costas, who had a petit mal seizure. Do you think that was a faint or a seizure? No, it was a seizure. I'm pretty sure about it. She has a she had a history of seizure uh, as well, and she did warn me prior to surgery. And uh, what she did was, uh, she essentially was doing that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. During surgery, so it was nothing bad. The patient uh, recovered almost immediately for it. My anesthetist was next door, so I gave him a shout, and that's why it's important to have someone to come and help you if something doesn't go as planned. He did come next door, he reassured us, he gave her a, a, a bit of sedative, and then she, when she came by very, very quickly, and she was very happy with the result as well. And it was yeah. just a removal of a ganglion from the distal phalanx. So right. it was nothing, it was not, she didn't have anything major as well uh, done. So it was definitely a petit mal. Right. I just want to uh, warn people, though, that probably 2 or 3% of the time, people do faint, even if they're lying down. You should never inject people sitting up, because they're going to faint even more. Because people faint because there's not enough blood going to their brain. So if you lie them down, there's a lot less chance of that. But if people say, I'm not feeling very well, or I think I'm going to be sick, or if you look at them and they're pale right here, they're going to faint. And so you got to get more blood to their brain. So you lift up their thighs and get the blood from their thighs running to their brain. You take the pillow out from under their head, put it under their feet, and you put the bed in Trendelenburg with the head down. Now they get more blood to their brain. Then you can let the nurse run and get the cold, wet face cloth, which does absolutely nothing for cerebral blood flow. And the patients will be fine. Can I ask a question, Don? When you do steroid injections for either trigger fingers, the curve vents, or carpal tunnels, do you administer them with the patients lying down? Yeah, uh, I usually do, actually. <laughs> yeah. I've seen too many people faint <laughs> unnecessarily. The other thing I'd like to point out is that in Europe, and I think, please forgive me, I'm not sure if from a drug point of view, Cyprus is part of Europe or not, but you can get Oriverse in Europe, and Oriverse is available to dentists. You can get it from your friends. That is fentolamine. It's pure fentolamine. That's what it is, and it's. I have actually, tried very hard. 
to find uh, to find it and I couldn't find it. But to be honest with you, I never needed it. No, you don't. So I, but it's so I nice didn't pursue it very hard, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think everybody who has access to or to phentolamine, whether it's Oriverse or phentolamine, uh, should try it at least once. It just, you know, it gets the nurses more relaxed and everything, because you don't have it in uh, Kuala Lumpur either, do you, Amir? Nope, you don't have it here. And, and you don't need it, but it's, it's nice, you know, it makes people feel better. I did a table saw uh, about six months ago, and there was just one artery and a little skin bridge left on the thumb. And it was really, really white at the end of the, you know, I fixed the tendon, the K-wire, the bone, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I just thought, you know, why send them home like that? I just injected phentolamine, Within 15 minutes, the whole thing pinked up and everybody was happy, including me. I mean, it, if, if you have it, try it. That's all I'm saying, because then everybody's tension will relax and they're not going to be afraid of the boogeyman under their bed because there is no epinephrine death if you have phentolamine. What you do have to watch out for, though, is people with numb fingers burning their fingers in hot water trying to get the feeling back after local anesthesia because the most common cause of fingertip loss after local anesthesia is patients burning their fingers trying to get the feeling back. And I've had bupivacaine in my own fingers and it lasts, it's numb for like 30 hours, I hate it. And I can see why people put their finger in hot water trying to get their feeling back. But in those patients, if you look at their burn and some people blame that on epinephrine, You'll see the watermark, you know, you'll see a blister at the base of the burn. You don't get blisters with ischemia. So pay attention to that uh, in case that should ever happen. I think that's, yeah, I think we're, unless anybody else has any other questions. I think the, um, the interesting thing to move forward is, is a lot of the, from an orthopedic point of view, is a lot of what Ami is doing. Um, you know, I, I don't need to do distal radiuses under local. I, I have a fantastic anesthetic service. Um, I, I, I can't justify it at the moment. I think if I had an LD lead patient who, who couldn't have a general, absolutely, I, I would totally go for it. Um, I have every faith in it. it it's just, as we always say, you know, th this is down to people's preferences. You you do different stuff, Don, under Wallan than I do, than Costas and, and, and Amir. It, it, it has so many benefits and uh, not just from cost, efficiency, um, getting operations done. There's lots of different reasons for people to do it. And you just need to pick up a knife and a syringe and, and get on with it. To be honest with you, I think that it's a use, a very use useful skill to have to know how to perform Wallant for any orthopedic case that you can do Wallant. You never know what will happen. I mean, in my practice in Cyprus, uh, my anesthetists cannot do regional blocks. Now with the introduction of the new healthcare system, because we do have universal healthcare in Cyprus now, he's very busy covering all the other specialties in my hospital, and he doesn't have much of a time for me. So the fact that I can do my cases under Wallant, almost all of them it liberates him to do other people's cases and it liberates me because it gives me theater space without any worries that i still need from everyone anyone so it's it's actually a very very good thing to have and even in the nhs where i have substantive experience working for various hospitals i can tell you that wallen can be a very useful thing we have Sometimes my regional anesthetist can take up to one hour to numb the, the first case. In one hour, I can have one case done. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And then it means that I can do four cases in a day, in an afternoon instead of three. So it will moment. not create a rollover effect and everything like yeah. that. Especially so with coronavirus cannot... around as well, Costas. You know, our anesthetists exactly. are absolutely blown to the wind. They're in three different hospitals in Southampton now doing, you know, two per case. I don't have an anaesthetist. We've got two uh, elective lists 
for 26 orthopedic surgeons every week. Yeah. So that's 24 orthopedic surgeons not doing any elective every week. And the other thing I want to emphasize on is field sterility. We really need to employ it more in the UK. There is absolutely no reason why a carpal tunnel should be done in the main theater, like in every trust that I have worked in the UK. Absolutely no reason for that. Huge weight of, waste of resources, and they still operating time in the main theaters from patients that really need it. Patients with carpal tunnels can be done safely in the office or in small procedure rooms without compromising anything. And there's very good evidence for that. Amir, did you exactly. want to talk a little more about cost issues as well uh, in Malaysia for Wallant for your bigger orthopedic cases? Yeah, exactly. For, for us, uh, the anesthetist part is a bit big issue because um, they have to cover a lot of things. So when I introduced this to my previous uh, government hospital where I previously worked, it takes a lot of burden from them. So we can do our simple cases um, under Walan where they can focus on spine cases, um, intra app injuries, other, other cases that need, really needs them. So uh, it does really help um, to those who are really, um, tr I mean, we have to convince people about this. I mean, that's the only way to go. Prof, Don, can I have a question? Yeah. Uh, Prof, uh, we have, uh, that's a fantastic thing that you've invested so much on Valent and it's already all over the globe. So just for the benefit of our readers and listeners, uh, can you mention a few contraindications or where we need to have special precautions? For example, are you really concerned if a patient has a Raynaud's phenomenon, a vascular insufficiency, or a patient who has only a single artery? For example, we have radial ulnar. Suppose a patient has a single patent vessel. Is there any concern? Right. So, uh, in general, I like to just do a tissue perfusion of the fingertip. If they got good reflow before my surgery, they'll have good reflow after. The epinephrine's not gonna do anything to it, as long as I don't cut the blood supply with my surgery, <laughs> which is possible if you're doing things like Dubitrens, for example, where you're, you, know, you might cut an artery and so on and so forth. So in general, I personally don't worry about Raynaud's phenomenon. I have injected a number of patients with Raynaud's and I have not had any trouble. There is one patient that I heard of who had Raynaud's, who had lidocaine with adrenaline in the finger and then had a reversal with phentolamine and apparently lost part of the tip. I'm still not totally convinced it wasn't a burn, but it's possible that it wasn't a burn. Uh, so I don't really know for sure, 100% of any loss with Raynaud's. Having said that, if somebody comes in and they hardly have any blood going to their fingertip, whether it's Raynaud's or Berger's disease or renal failure, why would you inject adrenaline? You don't have to. <laughs> like Costa say, you just inject lidocaine. And even the, light, even the epinephrine part, you can use plain lidocaine, it just bleeds more. There's this whole myth about, oh, we have to have a tourniquet or we're operating in a sea of ink. It's not a sea of ink. And it's a little bit of bleeding. I mean, any surgeon can take a little bit of bleeding. I mean, if you're an orthopod and you've done a total hip, you didn't do that with a tourniquet, and that was a little bleeding there and it didn't kill you. And it's the same thing with hand surgery. And there is one thing that's true though, the more epinephrine there is, as in one in a thousand makes your finger way more white than one in a hundred thousand, because I've had both. And it also lasts longer. So the higher the epinephrine, the greater the duration of the uh, vasoconstriction and the more the intensity of the vasoconstriction. But Teddy Prasetyono in Indonesia, he uses one in a million adrenaline for all of his wallet cases, and he thinks it's just fine. So even though it's theoretically possible that adrenaline kills finger, in real life, it doesn't. And also they do, you, uh, I mean, Jason does um, replants. <laughs> right. In uh, fact, uh, well, uh, yeah. I've done one patient with Raynaud's. I did her uh, trigger finger. She had 
And, and I didn't actually know that she had Raynaud's when I injected her because her fingers weren't blue at the time. So I injected her trigger finger right there. And then when I came back to see her, I injected the long finger. When I came back to see her before a surgery, the ring, the small, and the index were blue. <laughs> blue, blue, blue. And the long finger was bright red pink, the one I injected with lidocaine and adrenaline right here. Because the sympathectomy of the lidocaine gave her a pink finger distally, epinephrine only works where you inject it. If you inject inside the sheath, boom, you're going to get a whole white finger all the way to the end. But you should never inject inside the sheath because it hurts a lot. I know I've had four intrasheath injections, three of them on purpose. Any more questions? I think we have discussed a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 